but thank you all for being here. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about our second part uh, to the Virginia Classics series. Uh, the first time we had a really good time trying to, you know, look at several different localities of one presentation, which were a little bit shorter than kind of going into a much larger uh, presentation. We also decided that for tonight we would break it down into just three locations, uh, two primary and one kind of secondary. Um, the first one we're going to talk about tonight is going to be iridescent hematite from Allegheny County in Virginia. Um, the second one's going to be bargers or bargers quarry. Uh, you'll hear me say both those words tonight. I apologize. I've always said bargers. I don't know that some people also call it bargers quarry, uh, and, which is in Lexington. Still, I guess, if you want to go into semantics, may be classified Rockbridge County still, but it's right there on the border of Lexington. Uh, and then the third one will be the Lamanite cubes from Albemarle County in Virginia. And um, that, you know, extends into the entire county, even in Nelson County. And there's several different locations for Lamanite cubes in Virginia, but we're kind of going to hone in on this one because it's an area where if you're looking for exposed soil, you'll probably have a good chance of at least finding something. So there's a lot more uh, productivity of the county compared to other counties that have had uh, similar occurrences of laminite cubes. You can see the three little stars here on the map. Um, Allegheny, of course, is the yellow star. It borders West Virginia. Uh, right next to it's actually Rockbridge uh, in Lexington in the red star. And then Albemarle County is right there with the blue star. So relatively speaking, we have three locations that are not far from one another, which is kind of cool because the geology and everything is just so different and so complex between each location, which is just one of the cool things about geology, mineralogy, how we find these different locations not that far away from one another to have unique specimens. So first we're going to start with iridescent hematite. And, you know, I always laugh because I, th I think this is probably one of the locations that if someone comes into my house and they see my display cases, it doesn't matter if they love minerals, they hate minerals, whatever. You could be completely not interested in minerals. People notice the rainbow rocks, as they always call it. They always say, ooh, what's that? They always think, is that real? You know, is that natural? But it's always the, you know, the attention grabber in the collection. So I, I really like this location, not because it's just mineralogically interesting. It's interesting because it's a great kind of talking piece to get people into minerals and into the hobby because it's just so attractive to a multitude of people. I mean, some of us love micro minerals, some of us love, you know, pegmatite minerals like the Rutherford number two, but we all know that, you know, tantalites and combites, they're, they're cool, but, you know, to some people they may not say, oh, that's, you know, the rare earth elements and minerals are not that pretty. Um, but the location itself was actually discovered in the 1970s during the development of a service road in the George Washington National Forest. And it was during this discovery that they noticed several large voids which were uncovered showcasing the stalactitic hematite. Um, we must note here that hematite and iridescent hematite is not that rare. I mean, you can find it in several different locations in Virginia. You can find it across the East Coast, across the world. Um, but what was so unique about this location was the space in which it allowed the stalactites to actually grow. Um, I actually have the original uh, transcript to Howard Freeland's publication, which he post posted in uh, Rocks and Minerals back in the day, and also in the Virginia Department of Mines and Mineral Energies uh, Virginia Minerals publication. And he noted that there was a, there was a pretty large void in the, in the middle of the road cut when they were hitting it, and it was two to three to one meter high. So it's a pretty large space. It doesn't mean that you have giant stalactites forming in here, but there was chunks and there was enough space to form really nice stalactites. Uh, and that's the real key with this location. And of course, you could say that construction workers are always out there possibly exposing cool locations every day. What made this special? Well, just like people walking into a collection and seeing the iridescent hematite or the rainbow rocks, they said, holy crap, what is this color on these rocks? And so it was that exposed rocks that had this coloration on it that really drew their attention. And as we were talking before we started, uh, it's known as tergite. Um, 
we'll talk a little bit more about the term itself and how it kind of came into being and why we use it. Um, but that's that for there. And so after the discovery, we, we're all collectors here, we pretty much know what happens when you discover something. It didn't take very long for the bulk or the primary amount of the best specimens to be collected. So several geologists and collectors visited the site in the 70s. Uh, you'll see a lot of times that some people will date material and they'll say pre-1980s, which is basically just saying it was before the 80s when the main discovery was actually um, collected. And people like uh, Dr. Mitchell and Alan Pinnock and others traveled to the location, looked at it, and of course we've seen it in all the other Virginia Mineral Locality books and other publications. So it didn't last long, and we would, we would consider this location to be defunct in a lot of ways because most of what was collected is not there any longer. It was a very localized and small location. On top of that, it's also in the National Forest, so we have to be reminding ourselves that when you're looking at sites that have occurred in the National Forest, you're not allowed to collect without a permit, so that's not an advice thing to do, and that's just a general term there. This is actually a really, really nice piece, again, just showing you the coloration. There's not much aesthetic, you know, things going on besides the color on this piece, but a really nice specimen that shows you really the true potential of the location. So I want to get to a brief just a little bit about the geology because it's actually important to like how do we get the space that, that formed in there to allow uh, the specimen over here to the right um, is kind of what I would say your typical material from Peters Mountain from this iridescent hematite location and Peters Mountain is the area that it was found in. Um, the mountain itself is anticlinal in structure so for structural geology terms it's basically a hump rather than a trough it's material that's been pushed up and it's containing these various shells and sandstones that range from the Ordovician to the Devonian. The deposit that we're actually looking at specifically is a little bit more concentrated. It's within the Kiefer member of the Clinton Formation, and that's Silurian, so it's in between the two uh, groups. And one thing that was interesting that was noted when they first discovered it um, is that the stalactites, as they were exposed at, in 1970, were actually vertical in their orientation. They were still following, you know, gravity, which meant that they had formed after uh, everything had been formed. So there was no regional tectonic deformation that happened after the hematite stalactites. We, we did find some specimens um, that were, it was always interesting because we were always trying to figure out, we'll talk about it, you know, when did the color actually come into play? Um, and we do see some specimens that are stalactites that have been broken off, maybe an earthquake, maybe some sort of activity. And the surfaces of those breakages are actually covered in iridescent hematite. So there was still some sort of activity going on after these things had been formed, but they, they are forming in that vert vertical orientation. So it wasn't as if they, you know, were sideways or turned upside down or something had happened. They were, they were there when it was forming. And so how did the hematite actually have the space to form? Because you can go around this entire area, and for those of you that know a lot about Virginia's mineral history and mining history, the entire, you know, uh, valley and ridge and area has tons of iron deposits, right? That's, you know, the Virginia Iron Belt. You have all the different iron ore there. You can see all the smelters, you know. You get on the Facebook groups, and you always see people saying, I found obsidian, and it's really, you know, the... Um, slag glass and so the sandstone here had been heavily brecciated very localized again and it was the hematite ore that kind of went in cemented into that brecciation and in some of those voids they were large enough and had enough space to really form uh nice stalactites um for those of you that you know go into the allegheny area and go into other places uh you can go to creek beds sometimes and you can see some like little not great pieces of botryoidal hematite or stuff like that. They don't have, that doesn't have much space to form. So even though it's common, this is still a very notable locality because of the space that allowed it to form. Now we don't know if there's a fault right going right through the area of the, the, the exposed part, but there has been a very localized zone of brecciation. Um, and then again, it's these open voids and spaces which actually allow for that to form. But of course, I'm sure everyone wants to know, and that's the biggest question that everyone asks, how in the heck does something look like that naturally? 
how do you get this incredible iridescent coloration? And this is a specimen, probably my favorite uh, specimen that I photographed several years ago. Um, it's in the collection of my dear friend, Alex Bradley, who I'm going to put on the spot here in a second to uh, help us out with some of the technicalities um, regarding the color. But this is probably one of the most vibrant uh, specimens that we ever collected um, uh, in collections and different things like that. I haven't seen many that have been this vibrant before. Um, it is important to note at the start that tergite, as we talk about it, is not actually a mineral species. Um, it was actually termed first by a German mineralogist, Rudolf Hermann, in 1844, when he was describing an iron hydroxide specimens that he had found through the, I'm probably going to mispronounce this, the Turgensk River in the Ural Mountains. Uh, and so that was the first time we saw that term used per the locality, so there was some sort of reason behind it. But that term has continued on since 1844 and has just kind of been, you know, um, used by the collecting community to describe this iridescent hematite. But as you probably see, what I noted there is that the IMA also says that it's not really hematite only, but they suggest it was a mixture of microcrystalline hematite and gertite. Um, it's interesting to note that a lot of the tests that had actually been done on some of these specimens do focus on it being gertite rather than hematite, at least on the surface in a lot of these specimens. And so this is where I don't want to get into too many technicalities because we definitely want to get into the pictures and stuff, but it is important to note that there's been several studies by Caltech and Virginia Tech and now the Smithsonian um, that are trying to kind of understand the mechanism behind the color and iridescence. Uh, the first uh, tap at it uh, really came with Rosman and Ma in 2003 and they were using a scanning electron microscope and from their findings they said it was a thin film of rod-shaped nanocrystals that measured between 5 and 35 nanometers. They noticed that there was these significant levels of aluminum phosphate ratio and they didn't have enough analysis to actually properly identify it as a new mineral species but that was kind of what they were thinking and so they kind of just attributed it to this thing called a thin film interference. Uh, you can see here is a really interesting photograph. This is a surface, not of this specimen specifically, but of a hematite or iridescent hematite from Brazil. So you can see these nano rod structures that they're talking about under this electron microscope. So really when you start getting on a small scale, that's how we've been able to understand a lot of this better because technology and our understanding of nanoscience and just microscopy and all the different techniques we have, have vastly improved. Um, the next research was 2015 by a master's student at Caltech. He rejected um, uh, the hypothesis by the first people and said it wasn't a thin film. It was actually something called diffraction grading caused by oriented aggregation. Again, we don't want to get into many details. That paper was interestingly enough rejected by the American meteorologist. I'm not quite sure why. I don't know if it was just publishing, you know, the nature of publishing and how that worked out, but that was the second attempt. When I went to Virginia Tech, this has always traveled with me my entire life, uh, when I went to Virginia Tech, they were actually looking into it as well, saying it was some sort of interference pattern, diffraction that was going on. It was the spacing of those nano rods that were causing a diffraction grading of visible light that was creating this color that we were seeing. And then when I was in a meeting the other day uh, with the Smithsonian, uh, Jeff Post, um, he mentioned that some of them were trying to look at this as well. So there's still a lot of stuff out there really trying to understand the mechanisms. Now the environment of how that actually happened and when did it happen and, you know, we found a lot of specimens that would be a, you know, a large piece of hematite and on it would be one little dot of iridescence. And you would ask yourself, how in the heck could you have this large piece and have these sporadic spots? Um, again, I'm not a mineralogist, so I'm not going to claim to know that, but it's just very interesting. And so you see this discussion about structural iridescence, diffraction grading, and oriented aggregation. And then, you know, Alex and I were just kind of talking about that night. We said, should we be calling this iridescent hematite or photonic hematite? And uh, Alex, if you want to here, uh, you probably can explain a little bit better between the differences here regarding like maybe what we're talking about when we're talking about the causes of the coloration. Yeah, so, well, I don't know 
what the particular mechanism is that causes the, the color, but um, the term iridescent is problematic because it turns out iridescent has a particular, uh, a specific definition in physics, and it's, it, it's essentially um, something where the color changes with changes in the um, viewing angle, so the angle at which light reflects off of a surface. So think of like the back of a CD or a DVD. As you turn that, as you orient it, it changes color. Um, to the best of my knowledge, all the specimens of, of this rainbow hematite that I've seen don't do that. They, the color is consistent no matter what the viewing angle is. Um, so it's not technically iridescence. Um, so it, and it's also not any kind of inherent color, so pigmentation or anything. So it's a structural phenomenon of some sort. And there's a lot of different kinds of structural phenomena. I was thinking when I was reading through the different mechanisms that uh, what's called a photonic crystal could be maybe the best explanation, but I don't know. Um, opal is a good example of a photonic crystal. If that is the case, then maybe photonic is a better word. Than, than iridescent, and I think it sounds way cooler. Um, if it's, uh, so it, it, like I said, there's a handful of mechanisms though that it can actually be, but I do, I do think it's a structural phenomenon. Um, when you coat these specimens in a clear liquid of some sort, um, it kind of works with water, but the more viscous the liquid, the better. It, it'll cancel out the color. The, the specimen will turn gray or brown the base color of the hematite, which indicates that it's something to do with the surface um, texture, like a butterfly's wing. And I, so, I didn't realize that. that it happened before, and then Alex and I were talking about yeah. it, and Alex Vinsky and I, when he had came over, he had showed a specimen that he had had, and you could breathe on it, and I guess the moisture, the water, and, and the breath would cause it to kind of go dull, which was kind of interesting, but, but yeah, sorry, I just wanted to say that. Yeah, well, I, I, I didn't know either. I noticed it actually when I was trying to repair a specimen and I put super glue on it and I did a bad job and I got some of the super glue on the color and it completely canceled it out in that spot. So, so think about um, that. I mean, if you've got extra specimens, a cool little experiment to look at that. But again, we can get a lot into the details of that. You know, that's something that Alex and I think we're very interested in looking at. It's, I always said every person that I met when I was out doing my project and getting interviews, we always had, uh, I'd say, one conspiracy theory and then one uh, scientific discovery we thought we had made that no one else had made. It just seems to be kind of a funny thing with mineral collectors, you know. And so I always said that this was, you know, uh, my thing, that I always wanted to understand this, you know, iridescence and the mechanisms, but more importantly, the environmental conditions and why you would only see certain spots on a specimen and then the rest was just normal. And again, like I said, the, these new advancements in technology will only get better. So I assume that we'll probably be looking at these in different ways and different mechanisms. And one of the reasons that uh, Caltech couldn't have really identify is that they, they weren't able to get any data or um, they couldn't produce an x-ray powder diffraction or an electron backscatter or Raman data. So they weren't able to really get down and actually uh, get a, a clear picture of what was going on. So. Very interesting to keep in touch with this and, and follow this because it is very fascinating. And, and calling it, again, uh, calling it photonic hematite would be really cool. So maybe you leave here tonight and say to yourself, is it hematite, is it gertite, is it really tergite, or is it even not even iridescent hematite, is it photonic hematite? Um, again, these are just some interesting things that we think about when we talk about the location. And I'll throw this out there. One of the reasons I do this project is that um, no no researcher, no researcher has ever used a specimen from Virginia in their research. And our location's very, very cool. And I, I like our spots, very different than a lot of other states and a lot of other areas, because again, it's not that rare to find iridescent hematite across the world, but we have a really cool area and the geology is very fascinating. And so it's always funny when you're in the methods section or you're, when you're looking at these research papers and they say, you know, we bought a Georgia um, Graves Mountain iridescent hematite from eBay. <laughs> you know, I mean, it just shows you kind of sometimes how the scientists and the collectors are at different fields on certain one of these things. But it is something, and these are just hypotheses that we've noticed um, during our time collecting. And these are two other pictures from the Ma and Rosman 
uh, data. You can see these really incredible nano rods here that they're talking about, and you can see that there's this 120 degrees orientation between the three different ones. Um, so you can see these pictures here showing you as you're getting really down on very, very small scales here and able to see surfaces that don't even look like what you're looking at by the natural eye. So really fascinating stuff. And I wanted to note a few different localities, so I just brought up some pictures. These are, these are not every place, right, because that would be way too many to list. Um, but three locations that you'll probably see a lot of or that you'll see noted a lot is Grace Mountain, of course. It's U.S. I'm always going to want to go with the U.S. one first. I've dug there. I'm sure a lot of you probably have collected there. A great place to go. Highly recommend it. got a lot of beautiful minerals there, rutile, lazulite, all these, kyanite, a lot of different things. Um, and the one thing that makes this location of Georgia specific is that they have a lot of these altered, gross-looking quartz crystals, but have been covered by the hematite and has that beautiful iridescence, so it makes some really cool specimens. Um, the Andrade mine in Brazil, uh, way different. It looks very almost splintery. It looks like wood. It looks very, very different than any other location. This is the location, funny enough, maybe because it's Brazil. Maybe that's where the research funding is in. Um, but Brazil was the main point of focus for the different research papers. They always wanted to have a specimen from Brazil. That could just be the, the bias from the fact that it was originally used from Rosman and Ma and has continued to be looked at from the Brazilian side. So maybe they're just trying to have consistency there. Um, and then uh, I'm probably going to pronounce this Tharsis or Andalusia in Spain. And that one has a lot of different specimens of this more like botryoidal look. But you do see a lot of different locations across the world that have beautiful uh, iridescent hematite. And there's a lot in Virginia too, just not the space and openness that you see with this location. And the last thing that I want to talk about, which makes our spot unique over any location, any location, is the occurrence of barite pseudomorphs. And I love these things. They look like Tic Tacs. Um, super, super cool. They always add so much to a piece, very aesthetic. You can see here that we don't have any coloration on these pieces. Most of them did not have coloration. I'm going to show you a photo here in a second that you'll see the coloration, but most were just very metallic in luster of the hematite, pertite. Um, and again, they look like Tic Tacs, which were fascinating. Uh, they occurred either as a single isolated crystal. If, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but the lower photographs here show one at the top of the stalactite, which is actually very large uh, for the barite. I'd say there may be um, half an inch, you know, normally smaller than that a quarter of an inch. And so you see they're singled out there, or you can see like at the top where you have these very nice clusters of barite pseudomorphs forming on these stalactites, just really incredible stuff. And the, the kind of phase in which that happened was of course, when we're talking about pseudomorphs, false form. So in a way they're not there, right? They've, they've you know, dissolved, they've been etched away, but there are some specimens that still have it. So you saw the crystals form on the hematite stalactites, they were then covered by the hematite, and then they dissolved, changes in the environment. And a few specimens rarely, very, very rarely, still have um, barite in it. But it has been noted for the people who've probably broken it open or, you know, researching it, that um, they're usually yellowish and transparent, but have been deeply etched, which makes sense, right, when we're talking about it. And they don't have any of the original crystal faces. Uh, the, the pseudomorphs themselves are very distinct. So even though you look at this Tic Tac here and it's very rounded, inside the pseudomorph for that encasing looks very, very distinct to the original crystal face that you actually had with the barite. Um, but incredible specimens for sure. Uh, there, I didn't have a photograph and I want to apologize because it was so freaking cool. So just imagine you have your hand and on the top of your hand, you put your hand, the palm facing down, on the top, you have maybe where your stalactites are growing or some botryoidal hematite. And on the bottom of your hand would be kind of a flat yellow or tan layer. And it would be filled with impressions of barite crystals, just sharp, jagged impressions. And there was a lot of specimens that were found that had these incredible backsides that were not like these, but they had incredible, um, you know, forms from where the barite had dissolved. Um, which is really interesting as well. And these are considered the top quality pieces outside the color, so these are more rare, rarely found in the deposit. 
Um, and again, that's what I talked about at the bottom. So yeah, these photographs, um, I apologize that you're seeing my fingers here, but you know, I had to deal with what I had to do with. <laughs> um, and then this is really fascinating. So I actually was very fortunate to meet with Lance Kearns a few years ago. For those of you who know him, he was the you know, mineralogist at JMU, very influential in our hobby. And I got a lot of material from uh, Richard Mitchell or Dick Mitchell uh, from UVA, um, who was very prolific in doing a lot of the research in Virginia. And when I went to Lance, when he was retiring, um, he gave me several different loads of material and research and data and different reports. And I actually have the original transcripts and photos um, from the Rocks and Minerals article written by Howard Freeland on the discovery. And here we see three different specimens of these barite pseudomorphs. Um, and these are scans, so these are the original photographs, and I can show you uh, at the end. Um, and there, this one at the top is just a classic one, and then you can see down here at the right, this is the one that had that encasing, right? There where you see that empty space. But- Can I, uh, this is yes. Juliet Shank, can I make a comment here? Sure. I uh, wanted to let you know, I have the original uh, journal, the Rock and Mineral uh, Journal, with that article in it. Oh, wow. What's, what size is it? Is it a normal uh, size? About five by seven or something like that. No, it's uh, not a magazine. Okay. Size. Yeah. Because, because I'm assuming a lot of, I, I do have an older rock and minerals. I guess at that time they were doing it a little bit smaller. I have scans of that article, but I don't have the original with That's really awesome. So I guess they were smaller back then. I always wondered if it had just been minimized, but it's nice. To, interesting to know that. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. But there, there has been barite that has coloration on it. And this is my top piece from the location um, that I was fortunate to acquire. And this shows the hematite stalactites, it shows the coloration, and it shows the barite pseudomorph. So this is a combination of every different factor of what you're wanting to look for when you look at this site. So a really, really nice piece. They're out there, so I'm not saying this is the only one by any means, but they're out there. So um, this just shows you all the different things we've been talking about at the same time. Um, we got some pictures now. So this is, you know, one of the things is that it's not always the Roy G. Biv colors that we always think about. There's a lot of really different shades and colors and different things going on here. You almost see like turquoise, and lavender, and different types of colors here. Um, you also see pink and green and different things. There's always a general trend in that color. So you won't see like red next to blue. I mean, there's always some sort of uh, focus there that could come back to the light play. It's always interesting um, to note that. Um, here's like, I would say like a nice specimen, but not necessarily one of the top ones you'd be looking for on the left. This shows you that kind of like oily texture, although we talked that it's not what's going on here, but you can just see that. Um, and that is on the sandstone itself and the iridescence. Um, yes, so it does follow that rainbow color pattern. Yes, yes. Um, and then here, you, you almost see that, like, like Kathy, Kathy was saying, on the specimen to the right here, where you see the red and the orange and the a little lighter yarns and the yellow and the green and the blue and the purple. And then it gets a little bit dark. You almost see black up here at the top. Um, I always call the piece on the right here, you know, don't mess with me. You've had a bad day. You're, you're angry. You're in, you know, five o'clock traffic and you flip somebody off. Um, that's not the happy piece, I always say. Um, to the left here is just, again, your normal stuff that you may find when, when people were collecting at the site, which was just this stalactites that were not colored, but were just really interesting, looked very unique. I mean, I always thought this looked like some Halloween haunted house. Um, specimen. And then over here to the right, you don't see much color on this, but you do see that there was a stalactite. Um, but on the stalactite, there's all these kind of frothy, many, many stalactites. So there was always really cool pieces where it wasn't really smooth, but it was, it was just this really frothy type of formation that was occurring. So there was several different types of things that would be noted at the location, not just very kind of fine botryoidal specimens. Um, here you have, you know, two stalactites that are kind of morphed together, but you see a single pattern. That's fascinating to me because there's space in between it, right? Um, there's actually just a little bit of space there. So it's just fascinating to see how these color bands transition so well when you still have some sort of space there in the middle. 
Um, I call the piece to the right the hokey bird. Uh, for those of you that know Virginia Tech, maybe you're not a Virginia Tech fan, but uh, I always think that it looks like a turkey and turkey feathers, and it has the maroon and the gold colors and all that different stuff, which you normally don't see at Graves Mountain and other locations. That really unique coloration is a little bit different. Um, this specimen on the left here shows you the botryoidal, kind of getting into some stalactites up at the top. Very faint color bands, more of that really metallic looking uh, color there. You'd also see very thin layers upon layers upon layers upon layers of this stuff. So each layer looked a little bit different. You also got neon colors, which were just really interesting because they were just so bright and so vivid. Um, just wild stuff. This is a specimen from David Limscombe at the VA Rock Shop. Um, highly recommend going and seeing David. Great guy. He's done a lot for Virginia. He's been involved in a lot of different things. And here you see him showing a specimen that is right next to the Minerals of Virginia book that we always talk about. So you're getting that size reference there. This is a massive piece, massive, massive piece. And you're seeing that there's stalactites within this general large block here. You can see several color bands going in between it horizontally, uh, almost restarting in several times, um, but a really, really incredible piece. And this is kind of what they opened up when they talk about a void. So you're not thinking of, oh, there was just all these small stalactites hanging down. It was more stuff like this, which was larger pieces with more smaller stalactites within it. Uh, I call this the, the Barney piece. Uh, <laughs> Or the are the are the T Rex? Uh, it does look a little bit like Barney. Um, and here you see that on one side you have very green, you know, purple coloration. You can see that thin little layer on the bottom. It's all you know the metallic coloration. So very thin. Um, and on the next side you almost see you see these bands, right? Of green and purple and green and purple and green and purple. A little bit of yellow, a little bit of green, a little bit of blue down here, but two different sides of the same specimen that just look vastly different. And then here's three other specimens. Um, the one on the left, the furthest left, I like that piece. I don't know, it's not a big piece, but the color is just so vibrant. It, it looks like a rainbow, it shows off very well. Um, I guess just because it didn't have a lot of the frothy material. Uh, the one in the middle is actually a Rudy Bland specimen. Um, it's an Andy Dietz's collection. Um, and the one on the right here also shows you the kind of yellow, the orange, the pink, the purple, the blue, the green. You can see that trending there. Uh, this is a really cool specimen. This is one of my favorite. Um, the pink and the purple, and there's just still some gray here, but that was another thing. You would see gray, you know, blah, but you'd also see this really kind of shiny gray and metallic gray. So is it color? Is it not color? I don't know if you would count it, um, but really nice stuff here. So really pink and purple. And then here you go. Here's some stalactites for you. Um, this is, as you can see, probably seven or eight inches. There's actually some pseudomorphs on it, um, right down here into my palm and at the bottom. So there's actually one or two pseudomorphs on this piece, but these are stalactites that are showing that true potential of some sort of space there. And as you can see, looking at the top of it, that this piece would be actually upside down. So I have it turned upside down. We always used to comment, and I always loved um, the bridges that form in between stalactites where you can kind of see it closing off with one another, where they almost look like they're going in the complete opposite direction. Um, so really fascinating piece there. All right, so we're gonna shift gears a little bit and we can come back to, um, the other places for sure if we have any questions at the end because again I don't want to get too much in depth on this stuff and I probably sound like I already have but trust me that coloration I, I do believe that we'll probably look at doing a presentation in the future really for those that are interested anyways to kind of do some of that more you know technical analysis and looking at some of those things because I think it's fascinating. So next, I want to talk uh, about. Thomas, this, yes, this is uh, Dewey Shank again. Sure. I, I have some pictures, a couple of pictures of my uh, hematite. If, I don't know if I can share it with your daughter if you want me to. Well, yes. Well, I would say after this, uh, we can email one another and get in touch, and would be more than okay. glad, yeah, to do that and talk with you about all that stuff. That'd be great. Okay, I'm sorry for interrupting. 
No, no. Hey, you're fine. I'm glad you're here. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Because I know that you said you had, you know, you had the hematite specimens. So again, that's why we do these things because it's always interesting to meet people who have these specimens and we can always talk about stuff because we put the pieces together. What makes a bigger story makes a bigger picture. And that's, that's what we're looking for. Um, so Barger's Quarry or Barger's Quarry, again, the apologies, you'll hear me say both of them. I've never really come to terms. Anyone speak up real tell me what they think it's called? Bargers or Bargers? Hey, uh, Thomas, this I, is Jim Doran. Barger. Barger. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's Barger, the Barger Quarry. Barger. Because I used to deal with uh, Chuck yeah. Barger Jr. getting the trips for the club. All right, all right. So I'll call it Barger. Hey, right. <laughs> R, Gur, Gur, Barger. Tomato, tomato. <laughs> yeah, that's one of those things that's really close. So we'll call it the Barger's Quarry. So interestingly enough, Jim, uh, it wouldn't always be noted as the Barber's Quarry. So it was actually opened up on the east side of US Highway 60 by someone named Howard Donald around 1922. So although this has been operating for a long time under Charles Barger and his son, it's actually originally Howard Donald who started it up. I don't know the name of it. I don't know if it was the Donald Quarry or how people would denote it. We see that at the Dale Quarry, right? Uh, in Chesterfield where originally, even on Mendat, you'll see it called something completely different, the original name. So they took over around 1930. I saw some dates saying 1932 as far as production uh, on the new quarry. Um, but they've been there for a long time. I mean, Barger and Son, they, they are very well known in the county. They do a lot of aggregate for the area. So this quarry is not just something for collectors. And again, we think about that, right? Why do we, you know, why do these quarries exist? Not just for the pure pleasure of us collectors. They exist for the community. They have economic value. They have community value. I mean, when you think about it, these products go out to the community. Um, so it's been around 1930, 1932 since Charles Barger and son have actually um, uh, owned the property. But interestingly enough, and I always thought this was a fascinating historical note, is that it wasn't 1922 when all of a sudden we said, wow, wow, look at these complex forms of pyrite. It was actually earliest as 1886 by John Mim. I keep wanting to say meme, but I know it's not meme. I, maybe it is meme, but John Mim, we'll just we'll give him the benefit of the doubt here. Um, first noted complex forms of pyrite in the Lexington Rock Ridge area. He was actually a, uh, a teacher at uh, VMI. Um, and he described it. Now, this is where it, it really took me back for a second. Uh, Pseudomorphs of limonite after pyrite. Well, for those of us that have dug or have collected at this quarry, um, I don't know how many of us have actually found a pseudomorph of limonite after pyrite. Um, but John Mim said there's pseudomorphs of limonite after pyrite. Um, these specimens were actually sent to the Smithsonian. Years later, when R.V. Diedrich was looking at doing the 1970s book, I think that was the time when I was reading, it was around the 70s. Again, when we think about Virginia minerals, we always keep what in mind is that the 70s and the 80s, the best times just for mineral collecting and other things, maybe to some people, but um, the 80s and the 70s were a good time in collecting. We can go back to the 60s too as well. But Dietrich found an area, a slope, a hillside that seemed very similar to the original reports by John Mann back in 1886. And he came to the conclusion, which is very interesting, that John Mim had actually not discovered the pyrite, which we know today as collectors within the quarry, but he had discovered these complex forms of pyrite that actually were pseudomorphs of limonite after pyrite in the oxidized and weather zone. So this was kind of a clay hill bank hillside. I don't know if you can find it today. R.V. Dietrich did not make any notes from what I had read about finding specimens, but the Smithsonian should have specimens that were actually the pseudomorph equivalents of what we know and love as the pyrite specimen, which would be fascinating to see. Just imagine what we know as those pyrite crystals to be as pseudomorphs of limonite after pyrite. So very fascinating stuff. Of course, mineral clubs come in years later, they begin to collect. Um, it is a quarry, so insurance is always a very important thing with quarries. Clubs have hosted field trips. We were talking at the beginning, you know, when did it go back? I remember in my lifetime, the Lynchburg Club, I went several years back. Um, so it's not impossible to collect that, but it is a quarry. So it's something that the club should look into and try to properly set that up 
And we're, we're talking about that as far as, you know, post COVID, I think it's a great place. And I went and actually met with the quarry, um, talked to the foreman uh, last year. So I guess before COVID drove out there on the way back from uh, giving a talk at the Richmond club. And uh, they're very, very nice people. Um, Charles uh, Barger and son have been very engaged. They have a YouTube channel for the products. So they're very proactive in the community. They have a lot of school trips that come there. I know when I walked into the office, he's like, Hey, would you like any pyrite? Of course they weren't specimens that I would probably want to collect, but they give stuff to kids. They always note that. So they do a lot of quarry field trips for schools. They try to keep specimens when they find them out in the gravel for kids. So they're a very nice company. Um, they've been engaged with the community for a long time. So I think it's just, as long as you can do it right, it's a great opportunity for future collecting. Um, when I was at the Shenandoah Gem and Mineral Show last year, two kids came up to me, two different kids, uh, and they actually had pyrite uh, from Barger's Quarry, Barger's Quarry, sorry, uh, in their hand, they were like, hey, look what we found in our gravel. And we see that with other quarries, right? Like up in Nova, where you see prenite, apophyllite, that are all broken up. But people have found it in their gravel. People find it out there in the aggregates that are produced by the quarry. So it's a really cool thing. Um, so yeah, so they've been a lot engaged with the community. And, and it's not uncommon, and I've seen it on our Facebook page, to see uh, people come and say, hey, what's this? And it ends up being pyrite from this area. So a little bit about the geology. So the rocks are carbonate rocks. And we talk about limestones. They're deposited around 400 million years ago. Um, it's the Liberty Hall formation specifically, which is Ordovician in age. Uh, for those that are like people that maybe live down in Southwest Virginia, the Liberty Hall formation is gonna come up in many, many times in many conversations, especially if you're a geology student or you take a geology class. I mean, it is a, a very notable deposit down here in layer formation. So. We've collected fossils in Liberty Hall formation, um, and maybe we can talk about this after, but there's a lot of people who've actually found fossils here. It was denoted that it was not uncommon to find pyrotized orthoceras fossils, which are like uh, nautiloid-type um, squid-like creatures um, that were replaced by pyrite at this location, as well as nodules and different things that are not as noted as much as these incredible crystals. They form in these clay lines and shells. The fresh material is black with weathered surfaces kind of showing kind of a gray tint. So when you look at a lot of matrix pieces like the one to the right here, you'll see that it's a lot darker, a lot black. And that's what we always think about when we think about the matrix pieces. Um, the quarry itself, like many quarries, has really cool structural geology. You know, sometimes, especially with the U.S. Silica quarry, they actually save that really fascinating diabase type in their quarry to show schools, they use it for teaching with colleges. So a lot of really cool stuff. The reason I bring it up though is that um, it was actually denoted by Alan Pinnock in his Rocks and Minerals article on this location um, that the folds contained excellent pyrite. Not sure uh, about that, uh, but, but, oh, we'll go back here. Uh, but it was noted at that time that there was the folds had a lot of more of the better specimens. Um, the top image up there is actually the drawing from John Mam in 1886, which is really interesting. Um, you can see there's a lot of specimens that look exactly like what we find today with five and four. Uh, one is very different because it's cubic, uh, which we do see cubic mixing with the, um, um, the octahedral form, and we'll talk about that in a second. Number two throws me off a little bit, as well as number three. I'm not quite sure the drawings are as accurate as he intended them to be. Um, but I think we'll see here in a second what he was trying to do with number three. But you can see that these are the pseudomorphs, as he called it, of limonite that was found in 1886, which looked just like the stuff that we see today. And so the crystal structure, right, that is what makes this special. I mean, people always denoted that bar, Bargers, Bargers, sorry, uh, Corey was some of the best crystallized pyrite in North America because it had just this very unique morphology. And so what we see here are these octahedral crystals are the dominant form. Single cubes are extremely rare, but it's very common to see combinations of the two, 
all right? And again, we don't want to get into crystallography and mineralogy and go too depth into that, but we'll talk about that in a second, how you can see both forms within the same crystal. Again, the dominant is octahedral, but you may see it with cubic. So if you see here in the middle, uh, you see that this is an octahedral shape, like the one down here at um, Harvard's collection. Um, this is an octahedral form. Um, but here you see these flat, stubby noses. And that's kind of where you're mixing in with the cubic. You see two different things kind of going on where the octahedral is dominant, but you do see this cubic trying to make an impact within the crystal system. Intergrowths of large and small crystals can actually occur in the same specimen. They get pretty wild. Some people like that, some people don't like that because does it take away from the really nice museum quality crystals? Sure, I mean, sometimes when there's too many things going on, it makes it look not as great, uh, but it's still a fascinating thing to look at. We'll have a few pictures, but the one down here that Harvard has on the right, the bottom right, that is like the purest form of like the, the typical bar bargers, bargers, Corey Pyrite right, that you see. Um, very, very nice, which does not have that really defined uh, cubic face there. And specimens themselves are normally only one inch across. I don't think I've seen anything that's greatly exceeded two inches. I would, I would, not, nothing three inches, nothing like that. If it does get to three inches, it starts getting a little gross, a little nodule, gets into some other things going on. You get a whole lot of complex, but you're not seeing nice single crystals that are, you know, um, above two inches. And then the sec, or the the one other thing that you notice here is the striations, right? That's what's cool. You've got these octahedral crystals. You have these beautiful striations going down these right, you know, that run down at right angles to the edges. Um, and they say that this develops from or represent this oscillatory development of those trapezohedral faces. So you can kind of see all these different stair steps there, um, which is fascinating. Um, and you see a lot of stuff going there. And then you'll see there's almost like a triangle in the middle, right? And this is where we talk about these other uh, intergrowths forming. A lot of the times you'll see that these sides um, form like that, but in the middle is when you're gonna start getting a lot of crazy stuff occurring. And we talked about it before and I, I will apologize because I don't have the, the most complete picture of this quarry. Um, I don't have calcite specimens or quartz or the barite and the fluoride that's been noted in this presentation. A lot of you that have collected there have probably seen it for yourself. You know what I'm talking about. There's some photos on Mendat. would highly recommend checking it out. But they're, they're not really the focus and they're not uncommon minerals, right? Because yes, fluorite in Virginia is not a common thing as far as crystallization, but we have locations that have, you know, flat surfaces of fluorite. I think they see, I said a lot of fluorite was actually on some slippage planes. You see some fluorite and stuff. Um, but again, that's not the primary focus here. Uh, right down here at the bottom on the left side is actually a cubic form and the dark limestone, which is really, really cool because that's very rare. Uh, and up at the top right is, um, for those of you that are on uh, Facebook with us on the Virginia Minerals Group, you'll notice that David Gravel posted last night um, his specimen of pyrite from Bargers or Bargers Corey. I'll never get that right, Jim. Uh, and he had a specimen very similar to this. This actually came from Wikipedia Commons, because I do my best to make sure I'm citing all the, the work that I put in there on that stuff. And it looks very similar to that, but I do think that what you see here at the top right is what he was trying to draw with number three, um, which doesn't look anything like number three, but I think that's what he was trying to get at. So this is a really conflicted specimen where you've got a lot of different things going on. You don't see any of those striations, but you, it's wanting to be octahedral, it's wanting to be cubic. You just see a really unique structure. Uh, and as was said in the chat, yeah, these pyrites are fairly stable. They're, they're not de decomposing at any rate that I notice. Um, the only thing is that some specimens have already been fractured um, and will have calcite that's actually filled in the cracks. So if you're trying to uh, get these out or prep them with maybe some sort of acid or something, which I don't recommend that by any means, but you may eat out the, um, the calcite. So there's, there are some specimens that have calcite veins running through it from where they've rehealed. Hey, Thomas. Yes. How big is that uh, top right specimen? 
Uh, the top right specimen is probably, I'd say, a quarter of an inch, maybe half an inch. Not that right, So pretty small. Yeah, yeah, pretty small. Yeah, pretty small. I haven't seen anything like that that got big. And, and it's a good thing you brought that up because I have completely forgot. Because I know that um, when we talked about that previously, you and I, we thought that they had almost been rounded out or someone had done something to them. I know that other people had said, it looks like someone's, you know, messed with this or they've tried to grind it down and stuff. But uh, it's it's pretty natural. It's, that, that's the cool part. It's just, again, it's trying to go into the two different phases of the octahedral cubic and it doesn't have any of those striations. It does look very dull, very worn, um, but it is, yeah, no, um, very, very small for that one. Well, I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe that's the baby form and it grows up to be those crazy striated octahedra. You know? Um, I don't know. Well, and I don't have any pictures of this and we can talk about this in the Q&A because I don't want to go from there, but yeah. Um, there are specimens, and I'll, I'll wait, bring, bring that back up when we get to the Alan Pinnock article, uh, because there is something that I'll show you that I think may uh, go to that. Um, okay. And then here is that. The last, uh, time I was, uh, the last time I was at the quarry, uh, there were uh, several people found pyrite suns. Pyrite what? Oh, suns, yeah. Sons. Yeah, so um, there uh, was notes in the literature um, regarding finding uh, nodules or very kind of larger oblique, you know, these weird uh, shaped um, nodule like stuff. Um, and the pyrite suns, yeah, I can see that. I mean, uh, again, uh, that how common it is or how uncommon it is, I don't know. Um, but I do know that they had talked about nodules. Again, when we think about the fossils that are found there and talk about pyrite and organics of the dark, you know, sediment and all the different things. Um, you know, I'm not quite sure if that the nodules are forming around the organic material or that was the nucleation point of some of these things that makes sense in other deposits. Um, but some of the nodules they reported were a foot across. Um, but again, I don't think they're anything like really nice to look at. I think they were just beefy nodules of, you know, pyrite in the, in the limestone that looked, you know, a little raunchy. Here, here's a great photograph, and this is from Worth Point, the one specimen uh, that I was showing previously at the, the first page. And this really gives you the best close-up photograph of this incredible uh, crystal morphology that's going on here. You see that octahedral face growing. You see that cubic face and that stubby nose at the front. You see that, you know, inner growth there where there's another crystal trying to come out of that one. You see those oscillation striations. Uh, down the edges there, and then you kind of see that triangle in between uh, that you see other little faces kind of forming. Um, so a very incredible specimen here. Um, it is interesting to note too, and I think I've seen this with other pirates, so I don't think it's anything unique at this location anyways, uh, and it's very common to see it, uh, that there's always this calcite ring around uh, the pyrite, which comes to the problem of when you collect it, because people would always go out and collect and say, I really want a matrix piece. We all want matrix pieces, right? That's the best for some of us. Um, but damn, is it hard sometimes to get out these metric matrix pieces when you have that thin layer of calcite that just loves to cleave so much and loves to break off. So it's always something to keep an eye on when you're collecting these because it will come off. So just be cognizant of that. Um, Here's a specimen, it's just one piece, but again, this is where you start seeing it's about an inch and a half across, maybe a little bit larger, and you see there's one primary crystal. You see that it has an octahedral form, but you do get the cubic faces there on the ends, uh, but there's just so much intergrowth going on here. There's so much happening that it almost takes away. You know, the top left looks great. Uh, the middle top uh, the middle picture in the top, you see, like I was talking about earlier, that fracture line that's been filled in by calcite. Um, another side of it are kind of tilts at the other angle. So do you like it? Do you not like it? I guess it's up to you of what you think is aesthetic. Some collectors would not want something like this because there's just so much going on that it actually hurts the piece. Um, but it's really interesting for sure. This is that inner growth, right? So you see we have something trying to grow out there in the middle. You have that original crystal. And then you almost see this ball or this nodule of pyrite crystals forming. 
but you see that they form within the center and I went all the way around it. So you almost have a complete sphere within the octahedral crystal, uh, which, is, which is really fascinating. So a really cool piece. I'll note here um, that this is the story behind these specimens. Um, so I actually, uh, years ago, um, uh, or I guess not two, year, two years ago or something, I was in an antique shop in Rock Ridge County and was looking at antiques. I like mining antiques. I love to go to antique shops. And I saw this uh, um, uh, china, uh, china cabinet. And in the bottom of it, I saw this bronze tray. And I looked in and I said, that's got some rocks in it. Well, it was dark and you couldn't see and you couldn't tell what it was. And I looked in there and I said, hmm, I said, that looks interesting. And I said, I'm in Rock Ridge County. I'm in this area. I said, hey, can you pull that out for me? And in this was a bronze uh, bowl of over 80 Bargers, Bargers, Cory Pyrite crystals that had been collected over the years, all singles, not on matrix, um, that who knows where they came from. And I got it for $60, including the bronze, the bronze, um, the, the bronze uh, bowl. So I think I got a good deal on that for those of you that know mineral prices. <laughs> uh, but it's just how that happened. So where did it come from? What was the story behind it? I don't know. But because I knew what I was looking at, I knew the crystal form. I knew how unique this location is. And that's what we always talk about, right? There's always these unique identifiers. It stuck out to me and I knew that what was there was Barger's Cory Pyrite. And dag on it, I was going to take that for $60. Uh, this is another specimen not as complex, but again, very, very nice. Really, really getting a good picture there at the cubic and octahedral forms uh, going on and those oscillation striations. And then this photograph, some of you may seem, say is very familiar. This is actually the pyrite specimen that we now use for our new uh, chapter of Friends of Mineralogy in Virginia. Uh, this is actually our logo specimen. So our logo was developed off of a Barger's Cory Pyrite, this specimen in particular, which uh, is a Buck Keller specimen. Uh, for those of you who know, Buck Keller uh, was a really popular, well-known um, Northern Virginia collector for the trap rock quarries up there. But this specimen is what we had in mind when we said, what can we do? We have so many incredible things in Virginia, but when we're talking about mineralogy and a Friends of Mineralogy chapter, you know, this just really hones in on that. And it's a great thing to draw and it's beautiful. And this is the specimen that we, we based it off of. And then this is Alan Pinnock's article from uh, the Rocks and Minerals. I will say this, any article, well, not any article, let me take that back. A lot of the articles that you would see that are paywalled in Rocks and Minerals, because they're, they're, they're you know, that's not, their primary goal is not to, you know, provide research for us. They are a magazine. They have to look at that. Um, these articles were first normally or even after published in Virginia Minerals by the Department of Mines, Minerals, and Energy. So you can um, go and actually find these free online copies of the Barger's Cory Pyrite location. So you can see it showing it down here. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's name you can find on Google Maps. So again, um, the clubs are going to be the future for this. And this is actually Alan Pinnock right here, and this is him at Barger's Quarry. This is a David Limscombe photo, and I really love this photo because Alan Pinnock has done a lot for recording information in our state, and so um, it was really cool to see a photograph of him at uh, Barger's Quarry. Um, and then these are the three specimens that were in the photograph. You can see how well uh, things have, have aged, right? Ha ha. Uh, you know, photographs from back then do not look like they do now with just their simple camera phone. Uh, so these are showing you all the different forms we were talking about earlier. Uh, and I want to go back to Alex's comment about these early forms. Um, this piece, and Alex, we had a specimen like that from that collection, um, is more nodulary, but they're very, very small, but they're very simple. They're not very complex. They're almost cubes. They're almost getting weird faces. And I'm wondering if maybe it is early forms. I don't know. I don't know how we would be able to know that. But you'd find these masses and some of them look like they had been nailed down like with a hammer or something. They were just flattened. Um, 
really, really gross looking, just blobs of pyrite, um, but maybe these were early things. And then lastly, because I know we're at eight o'clock, um, laminite cubes from Virginia. Um, so we've talked about pyrite. We talked a little bit about, uh, you know, limonite after pyrite, so the pseudomorph concept there. Um, but Virginia has several, and a lot of states in around the East Coast have a lot of different limonite cube prospects. Um, the one that I think stands out the most for Virginia is probably Albemarle or Albemarle County um, in Charlottesville area, even in Nelson. And, you know, they've occurred in various locations across the state. Some are denoted as limonite after pyrite or gertite after pyrite. We'll, we'll look at some specimens that may actually be gertite after pyrite. You can tell the more brown, lighter versions are probably the limonite after pyrite. The more silverly heavy versions may be gertite after pyrite. Um, so it could be easy to denote that. A little bit difficult though. Um, and again, these um, cubes are just uh, pseudomorphs, so they're false forms. Um, but again, that most notable area is actually Schuyler or Schuyler, Virginia. Um, and that was the home with the Walton's TV show, for those of you that may uh, have seen that or may know about it. So this area is very well known for its heritage on the Walton's TV show. And I'll give you a hint, uh, for those that want to go prospect, the area around the town and the area near the museum and the area in that general Walton's TV show area is filled with laminite cubes. You just need to get on private property, you need to talk to people or find exposed clay spots, but that entire area is filled with this stuff. So you can type in the Walton's Museum uh, in Albemarle County and that'll give you a pretty good area to kind of scout out for sure. Um, and so again, they're in exposed red clays around the area and there's a lot. I mean, honestly, it's fun to collect. It's a fun thing to do. It's very easy. You're not, you know, digging rocks out of, you know, hard rock or anything like that. You just pick them up off the ground as they've weathered out. You let nature take its course. You come back, you know, and you can find stuff. And um, you can find a bag full if you're in a good spot. So a really cool place. Um, they're not that great to look at, but, you know, still fun to collect for sure. Uh, and you'll see them referred to as jack rocks or devil's dice. So some people call them jack rocks. Some people call them devil's dice. I think the terminology used in Albemarle County primarily looks at jack rocks. That's what I've always heard people say. They've called them jack rocks. Now, I've said devil's dice to those people, and they give me a funny look. They're like, devil's dice? What the hell are you talking about? Um, so I think they, they've called them jack rocks, jack rocks. Different areas. I know down in North Carolina, they'll call them devil's dice. Now, back to Michael's comment about are the stable, are the, are they stable from uh, bargers or bargers quarry? Yes. Are they stable here? No. There's still pyrite in a lot of the specimens uh, in the inner portions. I don't have a great picture. I apologize. Uh, but you can see one from the old Virginia Minerals article down here where you do see that there's pyrite still within the middle of it. So you'll often find specimens that are cracked and broken or really oddly weathered because they're still undergoing that process and they are, they're not stable, they're not very stable. Um, as far as like how unstable are they? Like, can you keep them in your collection and not worry about it? Um, I do know our old professor, Dr. Anna, um, she had uh, limonite cubes that years later uh, were in her shed and years later she came back and they were all broken up or they all had, you know, more cracks in them. And I've seen that, I've seen them expand and, and I'm not expand, but you know, kind of bulge out and crack. Um, so they are pretty unstable. Um, and, and that goes back to not being fully replaced. Um, the one in the middle here is actually really cool because it's just a unique form, real long one compared to those, you know, the very cubic boxy ones over there. So that's a really cool piece. And then these on the right, you can easily see are the laminite pseudomorphs. They're very light. Uh, they don't have the same weight as you would with pyrite. And then this is the one that could possibly, possibly, uh, I'm not an expert here, I don't know how you would do it without actually testing it, um, be gertite after pyrite. Not, not light at all, very different luster, 
uh, and you can see the surface is very, very metallic versus the, you know, other ones. Um, this is actually a different spot than the other spots. Um, for those that are interested, I'll go ahead and give you a location. Uh, there was a, a place in Albemarle County that is a bed and breakfast, uh, and they actually have pigs that you can uh, live with in the house. If you want to go to a bed and breakfast where you can sleep with pigs and have them in the house and have them outside like pets. Uh, and it's a bed and breakfast out not far from the town where the Watsons was filmed. And uh, my friend and I knew, knew that the dirt that pigs normally bring up in their pig pen would probably be a great place to collect cubes. Uh, not my proudest moment, but as collectors, we have to, you know, do what we have to do sometimes. So we ended up getting the pig pit. We found like a gallon bag full of laminite cubes. Uh, so, hey, you know, whatever works, uh, you can find them whenever there's exposed soil for sure in that area. It's that common. Uh, and then this is a really cool uh, image because when we think about pyrite, a lot of time people first go to the Spanish pyrite. Um, this is actually just kind of showing you the, you know, it is cubic, it, it has very similar forms. Uh, this on the left is a Spanish pyrite, and the one on the right is a limonite after pyrite from Albemarle County that I collected. So we have two things that look very similar with one another, and I put this in my collection because it's a great piece that looks almost identical that shows you that transition phase between the pyrite and the limonite. And I think it's just a really cool piece to have in the collection.